So Neanderthals are often depicted looking pretty much exactly like modern day humans, just with bigger brow ridges and more animal pelts. But a few years back, a much freakier depiction of Neanderthals, or Neanderthals, I know there's some people who think it's Neanderthal, Neanderthal. Anyway, a depiction of Neanderthals was presented by author Danny Vendramini, who also has an interest in evolutionary biology. He wrote a book called Them and Us, How Neanderthal Predation Created Modern Humans. The main thesis is that Neanderthals weren't these peaceful dummies that we preyed on and killed off. Instead, they were the ones hunting us. He believed Neanderthals were apex predators, the stuff of nightmares, and that they looked a little bit more like this. Yeah, big, mean looking ape monsters. And he makes some pretty interesting points. I mean, for one, they did have thicker bones than us. They were stockier, stronger. We know from studying their teeth that they hunted and ate meat. He also looked at the shape and sides of their eye sockets, theorizing that based on how large they were, it's possible they were able to see in the dark, which is freaky if it's true. Or at least, you know, they had better vision at night than we did. And because these Neanderthals terrorized us for thousands of years, we have this fear of big hairy beasts just etched into our collective psyche. Now, there's a lot of debate here. His book is kind of controversial in the anthropology world, but it's a pretty killer idea. It would make for an awesome movie. Next on our list, we have the fact that we got a lot wrong about the true nature of Neanderthals, which is pretty disturbing when you think about how much work and tax dollars went into a bunch of scientists coming to the wrong conclusion despite years of research and an endless stream of resources. But whatever. At one point in time, it was believed, as James just stated, that both Neanderthals and humans lived completely separately and that Neanderthals were savages, but research shows that that was just simply not the case. In fact, Neanderthals, like humans, were incredibly resilient and knowledgeable and able to adapt to a wide range of climates. They were also, as James did mention, incredibly skilled and organized hunters who thrived on a certain kind of tribal societal order. But here's the thing. In in many instances, Neanderthals did actually live side by side with humans, and they bred with them too, which is why so many of us alive today actually do have traces of Neanderthal DNA, although not all instances of adult encounters were consensual, but more on that in a bit. In 2018, the bones of a young Neanderthal were discovered, and not only were they the oldest human remains discovered in Poland, the poor thing suffered a pretty brutal death. It had been eaten by some massive prehistoric bird. Man, imagine roaming around at a time where there were birds so big uh, they could eat you. And all you'd be armed with is a sharp rock attached to a stick. They were finger bones found in a cave in Poland. They had been digested. Unfortunately, the bones were too poorly preserved to conduct any DNA analysis, but the lead archeologist, Powell Valde Nowak, believes they belonged to a very young Neanderthal, stating they came from a very deep layer of the cave a few meters below the present surface, a layer that also contained the typical stone tools that would have been used by Neanderthals. Okay, so I know in my last point I literally just mentioned the fact that Neanderthals were much more sophisticated than we had previously theorized, and while that is true, it doesn't mean that they didn't do some seriously messed up things. It is believed that for over 50,000 years, while some Neanderthal tribes lived peacefully amongst humans, Others did not, and those who did not were pretty brutal about it. Turns out Neanderthals who didn't want to hang out with humans still wanted something to do with them, and that something is SEX. Scientists believe that in many cases Neanderthals killed and ate human men while forcing human women into intimate adult encounters. Some scientists also theorize that there was a time in which humans were almost completely wiped out by Neanderthals, but luckily humans fought back, and they fought back hard and they were able to rebuild their civilization and ultimately prevail. But when Neanderthals weren't uh, attacking us for our bodies, they were uh, looking at the ones around them. Inbreeding, it's something that we kind of frown upon today, to say the least, but throughout history, it was more common than we're comfortable enough to admit, and Neanderthals were no exception, which is gross, but not really shocking in the slightest. There are tons of theories as to how the Neanderthals finally died out. Some researchers think inbreeding could have played a big role. Inbreeding among Neanderthals was common. They often mated with close relatives like cousins, even siblings. This was discovered through analysis of bones and DNA. For example, a Neanderthal toe bone found in Siberia showed 
that its parents were closely related. So this would have caused problems for them just like it does in humans today. They had body parts and bones that didn't develop properly like misshapen kneecaps and vertebrae. Some even kept baby teeth into adulthood. Because of these issues, inbred Neanderthals were of course weaker and had a harder time having offspring of their own compared to early humans. Next up, we have got the fact that it is incredibly possible that Neanderthals did in fact partake in ritual sacrifice, but not the sacrifice of humans as far as we know. In 1921, bear remains were found inside of a cave in Drachenloch, Switzerland, suggesting the possibility of ritual sacrifices performed by Neanderthals and giving way to the myth of the cult of cave bear. After the discovery, some archaeologists came to the conclusion that the findings meant one thing, and one thing only, that the bears killed in the Swiss cave had been part of a coming of age slash rite of passage ritual performed by young male Neanderthals wanting to prove themselves to their tribe. While that theory is yet to be proved, and very well likely never will be, it's an interesting one nonetheless. So if you need any more proof as to why Neanderthals were scarier than we often think, uh, let's take a look talk a bit more about some of these animals they hunted, like the cave bear and the cave lion. I don't think it gets any more ferocious than prehistoric lions and bears. Cave bears were about the same size as modern day brown bears, sometimes larger though, likely weighing in at over 1,500 pounds. Bones of cave lions have been found all over Europe, with the biggest specimens being over 8 feet in length, and that's not even counting the tail. Terrifying. And what's cool is that along with these bones, cave paintings have have been found, which gives us a pretty good idea of what these animals would have looked like. Cave lions, for example, didn't look like they had manes of any kind. So yeah, thanks to all our proto-human ancestors for documenting that. For us. Next up, we have another theory that hits pretty close to home, depending on your beliefs, I suppose, and that is that the Neanderthals are wiped out due to climate change and a rising in the human population and disease and a decline in biodiversity. Sound familiar? When humans began spreading out over the globe, they became a serious threat to not only Neanderthals, but also the large animals that made up the majority of the Neanderthals diet, as well as the forest, jungle, and grassland areas that those large animals relied on to survive. You see, humans are not great at sustainability, and so they were killing these large animals at a rate in which they could not recover from. After that, they began wiping out lush areas of trees and grass that the planet so desperately needed to maintain itself. The climate began to change, making it incredibly difficult for Neanderthals to survive. Not only that, but as humans continued to spread across continents, they also spread their diseases. Diseases that, as James said, the inbred Neanderthal immune systems were just not strong enough to fight off. The combination of a declining ecosystem leading to immanageable climate change as well as deadly disease is ultimately what led to the extinction of the species. So I guess you have us to thank? But Neanderthals didn't die out entirely. There are traces of their DNA in us. Unless you're just straight up African, it's likely you have some Neanderthal DNA in you, especially if you're of East Asian or European descent. As Hannah discussed earlier, Neanderthals and modern day humans did interbreed, willingly or not, and some of that DNA still lingers in us to this day. These Neanderthal genes in our DNA can affect things like our immune systems, our skin, our hair, and there are some negative traits believed to have been passed down as well. Traits and adaptations that would have helped Neanderthals 40,000 years ago as they were migrating to new non-African environments, but aren't super helpful now, like sun sensitivity. Apparently people with higher amounts of Neanderthal DNA have higher risks of sun sensitivity. I don't know if this is just a myth or not, but I always heard that if you're someone who looks at the sun and then you sneeze, you might have higher Neanderthal amounts of their DNA in you. I'd always sneeze when I look at the sun. And apparently higher Neanderthal DNA could also be linked with higher rates of depression. So that's all very interesting. And we're going to start off the list with a very recent find. This just happened last month, which was February of 2024, for those who may be possibly watching in the distant future. A dude stumbled on a massive ancient Roman artifact in a riverbed. 
It was found in the gravel of the Torre River in San Vito al Torre. Arvino Silvestri was the one who first spotted the ancient artifact and alerted archaeologists. The riverbank was excavated and the archaeologists uncovered a massive block of carved limestone, revealing it to be an ancient Roman funeral monument, weighed in at a whopping 13,000 pounds, and it was in pretty good condition. It's so big and heavy that it required an excavator for transportation. Pretty remarkable find and quite beautiful as well. It has an intricately carved figure of Erotes on one end, holding a torch and a poppy flower. Erotes symbolized various things, including love and death. The decoration style suggested that the monument was from the high imperial era of ancient Rome, but at this point we still don't have an exact date range. At least it hasn't been released to the public yet. Again, this is still a very new find, but this wasn't all they found either. There was also a stone urn, a limestone carving depicting a man's face, and a number of bricks and tile pieces. Next on the list is what I'm just going to call the treasure trove. Now this news just came out last week at the time of recording this video. Archaeologists in Panama unearthed an ancient burial site filled with treasures at El Cano Archaeological Park. The burial dates back between 750 AD and 800 AD and looks like it must have belonged to an elite lord. The burial revealed the remains of a high status man who was likely between 30 and 40 when he died. Aside from bones though, there was a a whole bunch of treasure. Breastplates, belts adorned with gold, beads, intricate bracelets, earrings. There were even a pair of crocodile shaped earrings, which is pretty cool. They also found gold covered sperm whale teeth earrings. How extravagant is that? Not only do I have a necklace with whale teeth, but I gotta get them coated in gold too. That's not even all they found. They also uncovered bracelets and skirts made from dog teeth, bone flutes, and a bunch of pottery pieces. And on top of all the beautiful stuff this guy was buried with, he was also accompanied by a number of people who were sacrificed. He was incredibly rich, so he was just too above going into the afterlife alone. Next on the list, we have a horrifying pit of severed hands. Apparently severed hands were a big deal in ancient Egypt. Archaeologists made a pretty gruesome discovery when they came across pits filled with severed human hands. They were found during excavations of a palace near the ancient city of Avaris. These pits contained hundreds of severed hands, neatly stacked together, and the largest pit was right in front of the throne room. Researchers believe that these hands were severed from enemies captured in battles or raids. It's not entirely clear why these hands were collected and stored, but there have been images found of soldiers trading severed hands for gold, so some speculate that they might have been offerings to the gods or simply just trophies of victory. Next up we have the Herxheim archaeological site. So back in 1996, during routine excavations, archaeologists came across this pit filled with human remains. Now that's got to be alarming even for an archaeologist. I can't imagine you ever get bored with finding human remains, but what made this find even creepier was how these folks had died. They weren't just the remnants of ordinary burials. There were signs that these people had been deliberately and systematically consumed by other humans. The bones all showed signs of butchering. Cut marks indicated careful dismemberment. It looked like these individuals were not just victims of violence, but also of ritualistic consumption. The pit contained the bones of over 500 people, dating back to the Neolithic period. Some suggest these folks were eaten as part of some sort of religious ritual, but other researchers think this may have been more a case of desperation, possibly there could have been a famine. Next up, we have Neanderthal markings. So the recent discovery of ancient cave markings thought to be made by Neanderthals is obviously pretty exciting. The markings were found on the walls of a cave in central France and are believed to be over 57,000 years old, which would make them the oldest of their kind. The cave was first stumbled upon in 1846 during some quarrying work. It wasn't until 1912 that the archaeological finds started cropping up though, with a discovery of animal bones and tools that had likely belonged to Neanderthals. The cave seemed to have been sealed off from the outside world around 57,000 years ago, which is a hefty chunk of time before before modern humans even set foot in the region around 42,000 years ago. So it's a solid bet that the finger marks on the walls were the handiwork of Neanderthals. So, so what are these markings exactly? They're a series of wavy lines, dots, and 
faint striations, and it's believed that Neanderthals created these engravings by sweeping and pressing their fingers across a thin line of film on the limestone walls. The height of the markings suggests they were made by taller beings, teenagers or adults, but you know, were they decorative, ritualistic, were they even made intentionally? They're still not sure. Now we head back to Egypt with the discovery of an ancient Roman city in Luxor. The news about this incredible find was announced back in January of 2023. Egyptian archaeologists found a very well-preserved Roman city in Luxor, dating back to the 2nd and 3rd centuries CE. It's now been described as the oldest and most important city found on the eastern bank of Luxor by Mustafa Waziri, head of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities. The archaeological team unearthed a whole whack load of these ancient structures, including residential buildings, offering insights into how people lived during that time. There were also the discovery of two pigeon towers used for housing carrier birds, meaning the city was very likely involved in communication networks at the time. There were also metal workshops found in the city that contained whole collections of artifacts of their own, pots, tools, and a collection of bronze and copper Roman coins. Next up, we have the 4,500-year-old tomb. This is another recent 2024 archaeological discovery. I really tried to fill this list up with new stuff. So this discovery was made about 20 miles south of Cairo. Egyptian and Japanese archaeologists stumbled on an ancient Egyptian tomb carved into rock over 4,000 years ago. I always say stumbled on. Like these archaeologists are just kind of walking around and they're like, oh, it's an ancient tomb. Obviously, there's more that goes into it than that. It's just the easiest way for my brain to wrap my head around it. They stumbled on it. So anyway, the tomb was carved into rock over 4,000 years ago, dated back between 2649 and 2150 BC. The tomb contained a whole bunch of graves and artifacts from different historical periods. During their excavation, the team unearthed a bunch of treasures. There were human remains buried alongside a vividly colored mask, a burial site from the second dynasty, and an incredibly well-preserved alabaster vessel from the 18th dynasty. In the tomb, there were also two terracotta statues depicting the ancient Egyptian goddess Isis and Harpocrates, along with a stela with a man's name encrypted on it, a man named Heroides. Heroides. I think that's how you pronounce it. You've all heard of the Moe statues on Easter Island before, I know, but just last year, archaeologists found a new one. This new statue adds to the nearly 1,000 that have already been found on the island. This latest statue was uncovered in a dry lake bed, the only one to be found in that location. So far, anyway. The discovery was made by the organization that oversees the island's national park. Terry Hunt, a professor of archaeology at the University of Arizona, was incredibly excited about the find and described how important it is that these statues be retrieved, helping to preserve the history of the Rapa Nui people. So with how much attention and research has gone into the Easter Island statues, why was it that this one was just discovered now? Well, they're saying it's probably because of changes in the area's climate resulting in the drying out of the lake that was surrounding the sculpture, and they're thinking it probably won't be the last one to turn up. Next, we have another exciting discovery. News about this came out just recently as well. A ton of cool artifacts were found in Brazil. And this one's pretty cool because this stuff was discovered completely by accident. This really was like stumbling on it. So there was a routine construction project going on at an apartment complex, but then construction workers came across a pretty alarming find, human bones, and then more and more stuff started turning up. There were also pottery shards. So these bones weren't recent. Turns out all this stuff belonged to an ancient civilization dating back as far as 9,000 years ago. During excavations, they found thousands of artifacts, and not only that, but these artifacts could possibly reshape the understanding of human settlement in Brazil. The site known as Roseanne's Farm was full of stone tools, ceramic fragments, decorated shells and bones, which was excavated over the course of four years of intense digging. And in total, 43 human skeletons and more than 100,000 artifacts were uncovered. Archaeologists unearthed remnants of a group that existed around 8,000 to 9,000 years ago, meaning that humans moved into the region much earlier than previously believed. The leader of the excavation stated the discovery could, quote, completely change the history of not just the region, but all of Brazil. End quote. This finding may totally change the way we look at the timing and the roots of human migration into the Americas from Asia, which is pretty cool. 
And we're finishing off the list with the finding of a mysterious Anglo-Saxon artifact, again just in January of this year, in Langham, England. A treasure hunter made a pretty cool discovery with a metal detector. It was a small artifact made of gilded silver. It was just under an inch in diameter and 0.3 inches in height. Apparently it dates back to the 8th century. It also has an image of an animal engraved on top, along with Celtic knot-like patterns. Not entirely clear what the object is. The portable antiquities scheme, who are responsible for recording finds like this, noted the thing is similar to other items discovered in the same time period. But this one stands out because of its size and its design. Historian Helen Giak speculated that the spiral pattern on the artifact looked a lot like Celtic designs, and that the animal depicted could be a horse. Definitely what it looks like to me as well. She also praised the craftsmanship, noting that it was created by someone with a keen eye for beauty. And again, I agree. That thing, it looks fantastic. First off, we have the Bridgewater Triangle. The Bridgewater Triangle is an area about 200 square miles of southeast Eastern Massachusetts, and there's allegedly been just some weird stuff going on there. There have been asylums here, prisons here, there have been cult deaths, there have been all kind of human activity, UFO sightings, Bigfoot sightings, strange serpents, willow of the wisps, glowing balls of light, hauntings. I think these stories are not only connected to us, to our past, but to our region and to each other, an author from the area said. Yep, you heard that right, but that's not all that happened happens there. Giant birds or pterodactyl-like flying creatures with wingspans up to 12 feet are of claim to have been seen there. Now there are also the Native American curses. According to one story, Native Americans had cursed the swamp centuries ago because of conflict with colonial settlers. A revered object of the Wampangong people was lost during King Philip's War. Legend says that the area owes its paranormal unrest to the fact that this belt was lost from the Native people. Now, why do all these things happen at this location? People have no clue, but there's definitely something weird going on here for sure. Next up is the Mexican Altiplano Metal Balls. Hundreds of strange metallic looking spheres of unknown origin and purpose have been discovered by archaeologists exploring the ruins of ancient Mesoamerican temple in Mexico. The spheres were uncovered by camera equipment robotic exploration rover on the floor of two previous sealed underground chambers in the temple of the feathered serpent. Now they are thought to be at least 1,800 years old and are about 1.5 to 5 inches in size. Their cores are made up of clay and other unknown organic materials while their surfaces are covered in pyrite, also known as fool's gold, giving them a sparkly yellow coating. Now these spheres are thought to be offerings of some kind, as the temple was used by priests, but for now, no one can establish their function because it is an unprecedented discovery, said archaeologist George Zalva. Moving on to the Centralia Fire. The Centralia Mine Fire is a cold steam fire which has been burning in the labyrinth of abandoned coal mines underneath the borough of Centralia, Pennsylvania since at least May 27th, 1962. Yeah, a fire burning that long it does not sound too good. It is burning at depths of up to 300 feet over an 8 mile stretch of 3,700 acres. Now at its current rate, it can continue to burn for over 200 50 years. When the fire first started, sulfurous fumes and carbon monoxide began seeping out of the ground, nearly suffocating some of the residents in their homes. Now even more scary, the fire weakened the ground and it left it prone to sinkholes. Due to the fire in the 1980s, Centralia was mostly abandoned. There were 1,500 residents at the time the fire is believed to have started, but as of 2017, it had a population of five and most of the buildings had been demolished. Yeah, I don't know why anyone would still want to live there, but the fact that this fire could happen and there's no way to stop it is just so scary. Then there's the Georgia Guidestones. Located in Albert County, Georgia, these granite monuments called the Georgia Guidestones were huge granite stones inscribed with words of advice that the author intended to guide humanity forward. Now the creator wanted the stones to function as a compass, calendar, and clock. Meant to rival Stonehenge, R.C. Christian thought the Georgia Guidestones were superior because they had a message to communicate. The following inscriptions were sandblasted deep into the 
granite. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Unite humanity with a living new language. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things tempered reason. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Balance personal rights with social duties. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. And be not a cancer on earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. Now the Guidestones were written in eight different languages across six granite slabs. They were meant to serve as a guide for humanity in the world following a social, nuclear, or economic calamity. Now we have the unexplained lights of the Marfa. For more than 135 years, people have reported strange lights above the horizon in Marfa, Texas. No one knows exactly what they are, and that makes them both exciting and terrifying. Now the first sighting was in 1883, when a young cowhand named Robert Reed Elson saw a mysterious dancing light as he was driving his cattle through the plain. Since then, pretty much everyone has reported seeing the pulsating, colorful balls of light along an uninhabitable stretch of prairie southeast of Marfa known as the Pasano Pass. Now there's no way to predict when or where the lights will appear, but the glowing orbs generally form fewer than 30 times a year, usually just after the sun sets or rises. Now some say the lights are roughly the size of basketballs and dart widely across the desert or hover as they pulsate. Others say the spheres appear colored as they twinkle in the distance. Sometimes they're red, other times they're blue, yellow, or white. Often, a second orb will appear to split, merge, float, or melt into the first. And I just need to know, what are these things? Now let's talk about the Devil's Tramping Ground. In North Carolina, there lies a barren circle of earth where nothing grows, believed by some to be cursed by the devil himself. It's alleged that the devil tramps and haunts a barren circle of ground in which nothing is supposed to grow. Legends about the ring are well known in local communities. These include the disappearance of objects left within the ring overnight, dogs freak out not wanting to go near it, and strange events occur to those who spend the night with within its boundaries. Now it has been alleged that nothing has grown within the 40 feet ring for a hundred years. Supposedly it is where the devil walks in circles on certain nights, thinking of ways to bring his evil into this world. It appears that a journalist from the Greensboro paper spent the night in attack smack in the middle of it with his two dogs to disprove the story. The reporter stayed the night, though he reported hearing ghostly footsteps circling his tent. So what is causing all this? The devil. Duh. <laughs> Now we have the hum. The hum is a name given to widespread reports of persistent and invasive low frequency humming, rumbling, or droning noise audible to many people, but not all people. Now in late 2011, residents of Windsor, Ontario began reporting a low droning vibration, sometimes loud enough to be irritating. Now one evening in 2012 saw 22,000 reports to officials. It's estimated that the sound was emanating from Zug Island, a heavily industrialized section of River Rue and Canadian officials requested U.S. assistance in determining the source, but local authorities were obstructed by official refusals to allow access to the island. A steel mill operated by U.S. Steel was the possible cause, but officials stated that no new equipment had been installed or activated around the time that the noises became noticeable. Then there's the Teos Hum. A study into the Teos Hum in the early 1990s in Teos, New Mexico indicated that at least 2% could hear it, and each hearer at a different frequency between 32 hertz and 80 hertz. Now it seemed possible for the hearers to move away from it, with one hearer of the Tao's hum reporting its range was 30 miles. Now what was causing this? We don't know, and again, I need to know. <laughs> On to the Oak Money Pit. The Oak Island Money Pit is a mysterious site on Nova Scotia's Oak Island that has long been rumored to contain buried treasure. The legend of the Money Pit dates back to 1795, and what began as an innocent exploration quickly became a massive treasure hunt, with hundreds of searchers excavating the island for over 200 years. The Money Pit has been dug down more than 200 feet, but many believe the treasure lies much more deep, as deep as 500 feet. Now, as diggers have gone deeper, they've encountered multiple 
possible booby traps such as flood tunnels and stone plugs designed to protect whatever lies at the bottom. So far, the only artifacts that have been discovered are two links of gold chain and a stone inscribed with the letters V, I, and C, which some believe stands for Viva Cristo. Now, despite these discoveries, the mystery of Money Pit remains unsolved. Many believe it contains a great treasure, while others think it may be a hoax. While hundreds of theories have been proposed, from hidden pirate booty to ancient Native American artifacts, no one knows what lies at the bottom of Oak Island Money Pit, and I'm not sure we ever will. Up next is the Well of Sacrifice. At the ancient Mayan site of the Chichen Itza, a sacred cenote known as the Well of Sacrifice, it was used for offerings and sacrifices, including human victims, as part of religious ceremonies to appease the gods. As Friar Diego de Landana observed in 1566 after visiting Chichen Itza, into this well they have had and then had the custom of throwing men alive as a sacrifice to the gods in times of drought, and they believe that they did not die, though they never saw them again. They also threw into a great many other things, like precious stones and things which they prized. And so, if this country had possessed gold, it would be this well that would have a great part of it. Now, Edward Herbert Thompson dredged the cenote from 1904 to 1910, and he recovered artifacts of gold, jade, pottery, and incense, as well as human remains. And lastly, we have the Zone of Silence. The Zone of Silence is a spot in the Mapini Biosphere Reserve in Durango, Mexico, where radio and TV signals allegedly do not work. The name was only assigned to this place in 1966 when oil company Pemex sent some people to explore the area. The expedition leader, Augusto Harry de la Pena, encountered problems with his radio, giving it the name. In 1970, an American missile fired from the White Sands Missile Base somehow went off course and landed right in the middle of the reserve, 400 miles south of its intended target. Since then, similar stories have been reported by residents and tourists alike. In the 1930s, a Mexican pilot named Francisco Sabera said that his radio failed to function when flying over the zone. Now, aside from radio signals, telecommunication signals also seem to fall within this area. There are also reports that compasses turn out of control when positioned near the stone on the ground. Large meteorites also landed near the the zone of silence, and several theories have been made trying to explain these phenomena, but people think it has something to do with some sort of paranormal activity. Well, that's all for our list of the top 10 discoveries in North America scientists are afraid of. Now, have you heard of any of these discoveries and do they freak you out? Let us know in the comments down below, and don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. I'm your host, Emily, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Today we have the South Atlantic Anomaly, also known as the Bermuda Triangle of Space, which, much like its eponym counterpart, has been responsible for many strange happenings as well as dangerous circumstances within its parameters. Now, while the reasonings behind the many disappearances of ships and planes within the Bermuda Triangle remain highly debated but ultimately unknown, the dangerous terrain of space's version has recently adopted itself a scientific explanation, which I will share with you now now the best that I can. So basically surrounding Earth, there are two belts stacked on top of one another. The innermost is filled with high energy protons, and the outermost is made up of mainly electrons. These belts are held into place by Earth's magnetic field and play an extremely important role in protecting the Earth from particles shooting out from the surface of the sun, which can cause harmful radiation. Well, the thing is, at the point of the South Atlantic anomaly, the intensity of the magnetic field holding the belts in their place decreases, leaving an area of extreme vulnerability to satellites, spacecrafts, and any other equipment. Basically, anything that passes through the region will experience extreme radiation to the point of some serious damage. Okay, this one's not so much dark as it is exciting. I bet you thought that Mars was the most likely planet to inhabit life other than Earth, of course. But if you thought that, you'd be wrong. Or maybe you'd be right, as the most likely place in which 
which life exists within our solar system outside of our own planet, isn't actually a planet. It's a moon. More specifically, Europa, one of Jupiter's largest moons. While the presence of oceans beneath its icy surface have been confirmed, it is predicted by scientists and astronomers that deeper still, the moon contains geothermal vents, providing heat to the waters and possibly playing host to thousands of life forms. Some other cool things about Europa is that not only is it covered in oceans, but its waters act incredibly similarly to our own, producing 10 times more oxygen than hydrogen, which combined with all of the other factors in which we have just discussed, make the existence of life on this planet extremely scientifically promising. What do you guys think? Could this be the first case of real aliens coming to us in the form of single-celled organisms? And next on the list we have Lovejoy, the alcoholic comet that wanted a drink so bad it made its own. Not like at the bar, but it literally made its own alcohol, cosmically. Thought to be nothing more than just a regular comet glowing white hot, leaving behind a trail of space dust, Lovejoy has proved itself to be a whole lot more when in 2015 it decided to do a quick fly by the sun. When this happened, the 250 meter comet began doing something that had, until then, never been seen before. It began spewing alcohol at a rate that would satisfy an entire campus of frat houses. It is estimated that the comet released ethyl alcohol at a rate of 500 bottles of wine per second. Now this is already super cool, but it does get cooler. Because all jokes aside, along with the ethyl alcohol, the comet also produced large amounts of sugar as well as organic molecules, which when you mix them all together are the building blocks of DNA. Another instance in which we are possibly witnessing the beginning stages of life beyond the barriers of our own earthly existence. Moving on from C2H5, the chemical formula for ethyl alcohol, we have CO2. Not ours though, as scientists have recently discovered a large presence of carbon dioxide as well as methane gas and water vapor outside of our own solar system surrounding K218b, an exoplanet that is 8.6 times the size of our Earth. So what makes this interesting? This is the first time CO2 has been discovered outside of our solar system. Just another indication that we really don't know all that much about what goes on within the vastness of space. The planet, as well as the presence of gases and liquids, was not technically discovered by a satellite, rather a space telescope orbiting the sun one million miles away from Earth. So close enough. This discovery not only shows how powerful this piece of technology is, but yet another possible life-bearing planet as the presence of methane and CO2 and water are also all potential indications of such existence. At the halfway point, we are keeping it light with the discovery of Pluto's slug? A slug-shaped object making its way across the planet's icy surface known as the Sputnik Planum. The surface, not the object, they just call that Pluto's slug. Okay, now that you're all caught up, it's time for me to break the news. What looks like a giant slug making its way through the tundras of Pluto's frozen wastelands has actually been determined to be nothing more than an iceberg. Well, kind of. Rather, it's a floating block of water sitting on top of and sliding its way through the denser solid nitrogen which surrounds it. Not scary, but pretty cool. And there's some pretty neat stuff going on in this area that has nothing to do with the so-called slug as well. You may notice in the photographs, Sputnik Planum is covered in little bumps and ridges all across its surface. And that's because this particular area on Pluto is almost acting as a giant icy lava lamp. An oxymoron, I know, but hear me out. The ice on Pluto's surface is super nitrogen heavy, and Pluto's surface generates heat. That heat pushes the ice up, but when it cools, it sinks down to warm up again, up and down, thus creating the bumpy ridges that decorate the planum planes. So that was cool, but let's get back on track because next up we have the Cosmic Keyhole, perhaps one of the most perplexing nebulas discovered to date. Beautiful, yes. Stunning, yes. Understandable, not at all. The Cosmic Keyhole is a reflection nebula, meaning it's part of debris left behind from the cataclysmic event of star formation. Like a cloud of dust surrounding a street lamp, reflection nebula are lit up by the bright star whose creation gave way to their existence. While reflection nebula are normal and common spectacles throughout countless galaxies, this one is strange, and you can probably guess why. It's the massive amount of empty space directly at its center. At first, scientists believed this to be a Bach globule, which is a freezing cold, dense cloud of gas, molecules, and cosmic dust that blocks out background light. But they have since realized that it's not the case. In fact, the keyhole is something entirely different. 
it's actually nothing at all. The dark patch observed is nothing more than a completely empty region of space, never seen before unexplainable and incredibly bizarre. Now, I was going to mention black holes, but let's be honest, if you wanted to learn more about those, you'd be watching one of our many other videos specifically dedicated to the subject. Today, we're keeping it fresh, light, and light years away. Well, I'm lying again, because next up we have asteroid 2023 TK15, which passed by Earth at a distance of, not light years, but in fact, a distance closer to that of our very own moon, making it the closest a space rock of this magnitude has ever been to the surface of Earth, well, since, you know, the whole dinosaur thing. Too soon? Okay, the passing took place on Friday, October 20th of 2023, and absolutely nothing happened. Well, no, it was an incredible astronomical event that gave both scientists, astronomers, and all asteroid enthusiasts a lot to talk about at dinner parties. And hey, once again, we've survived the end of the world. Starting off our top three, we have the totally not at all terrifying magnetic explosions. Cool, cool, cool. So I'll put it to you this way. It happens every day, probably multiple times a day, and nothing happens. Well, something does happen, but I'll tell you in a bit. First, let me explain exactly what a magnetic explosion is. So, the Earth is surrounded by a magnetic field, which protects it from all kinds of things, as we discussed earlier, and it's called the magnetosphere. The Sun has something called solar winds, which are basically just a stream of charged particles that flow out from its fiery surface. When the solar winds, which contain their own magnetic energy, push against Earth's magnetic field, they tangle until eventually they don't. And they come out of it by snapping back and realigning themselves. And that action is what causes the magnetic explosion. Good news, nothing bad happens to us. Great news, something really cool happens. While the explosion is not visible to the naked eye, its effects are, as when the explosion happens, they tend to send tiny particles into our atmosphere, which manifest as none other than the auroras, of which there are actually at least 27, and the most popular is Aurora Borealis, commonly known as the Northern Lights. Next up, we have the Traveler. Not an alien, again, that's another video, but it is out of this world. And not just out of this world, but out of this solar system, and before it too. The foreign object was discovered on October 19th in 2007, and obviously was something no one had ever seen before. It was originally believed to be a comet, but that was incorrect, as it did not exhibit any behavior that would classify it as such. It was determined to be a space rock that had found its origins in a solar system completely separate from our own, and that had been roaming the cosmos for long before our own system's creation too. Not much else is known about the object, other than it's currently in our solar system, but it does continue to be monitored. Oh, and it has a name too, O Mau Mau, which is a Hawaiian term meaning a messenger from afar arriving first. So what do you think? Is it a sign that the floodgates have opened for objects from outside solar systems to begin encroaching on our own? Let me know. And finally, we have Hell Planet. No, not this planet. This planet. Also known as Exoplanet 55 Cancer E. This planet, which resides 40 light years away outside of our own solar system and hopefully plans on staying there, has a mass of about 8.36 times that of Earth and a diameter of about twice the size. It's pretty big. But wait, there's more. Because it's also on fire. And not only that, but it's mostly made up of diamonds. There's a lot going on. The planet is obviously uninhabitable for many reasons, among them being the fact that this planet's temperatures range from anywhere between 4,200 degrees to 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit, 1,400 to 1,300 degrees Celsius. The highest temperatures are reached on the side of the planet, which exists in perpetual daylight due to the way the planet orbits around its sun, but even the lowest temperatures which occur on its dark side are still unfathomably hot. Count me out of this SpaceX journey. All right, we're starting things off with a very recent and unsettling piece of news, that being that the Earth's core could be leaking. So by studying ancient lava, scientists have uncovered a potential leak from Earth's core. This research was published last year in scientific journal Nature. What they found in this ancient lava was a large amount of helium-3, which is usually only found deep inside the Earth, like in the core. So what this means, potentially, is that stuff from Earth's core might be leaking out. Now before this, scientists thought the core was isolated from outer layers, so 
This is like finding a leak in a supposedly sealed container, something scientists hadn't thought was possible before. So what does this mean? Well, helium-3 doesn't usually stick around for long. It tends to escape into the atmosphere and eventually into space. Finding it on the surface suggests it originated from deep within the Earth. Again, like from the core. Forrest Horton, a geochemist involved in the study, explained that this study, quote, raises more questions than it answers. So there is a lot of work to do. Up next, we have the discovery of a large metal ball located in Earth's core, meaning that we now know that Earth is not simply made of just a crust, a mantle, and a liquid outer and solid inner core, no. In fact, two scientists in Australia made a recent discovery that has led them to believe that smack dab in the middle of our planet is a gigantic, solid, metallic ball that sits inside of the solid inner core. This thing is huge. I'm talking. 400 miles thick, huge. The new discovery has been referred to as Earth's innermost inner core. Makes sense, straight to the point. It's fitting. As I said, it sits inside the solid inner core we've all come to know and love since its discovery in 1936. The innermost core was found using seismic waves that reverberate through the entirety of the planet, which is like crazy advanced technology. Through these advancements, scientists noticed a difference in the way atoms are packed in the inner and innermost core. Both are assumed to be made of an iron-nickel alloy with small amounts of lighter chemical elements, but the differences between the two layers of the inner core which give Earth its magnetic field and protect us from harmful radiation is baffling. And it also goes to show that we truly know nothing about what we think we know about this planet so far. Now let's talk about the deepest drilled hole in the world, the Kola Super Deep Bore Hole. So this was a drilling project carried out by the Soviet Union where scientists attempted to drill as far into the earth as they possibly could. Now why did they do this? Well they claimed they were doing it for science, but I think it was really just that the Soviets wanted to be the first ones to possibly reach the Earth's core. It was a competitive time. The drilling started on May 24th, 1970 and lasted for 19 years. Now, was it a success? Well, this borehole goes way, way down, like ridiculously deep. Again, it's the deepest hole that humans have ever dug into the Earth's surface. At its deepest point, it reached a mind-boggling depth of about seven and a half miles, or about 12 kilometers. Just to get a sense of how deep that really is, observe this image here. I was gonna call it a graph. I don't think it's quite a graph, but it's as you can see, deeper than Mount Everest is tall, larger than the asteroid that took out the dinosaurs, and deeper than the Mariana Trench. So what exactly did they find down there? Well, they discovered some pretty cool stuff. They found out more about the Earth's layers, like the crust and the, and the mantle, but eventually they had to stop drilling because it got too hot and the equipment couldn't handle it anymore. It would have actually started to melt the equipment. Next up, we have the discovery of ancient planets hiding below Earth's crust. In the 1980s, a discovery was made. Two continent-sized blobs made up of unusual materials were discovered deep within the Earth near its center. One is located beneath Africa and the other beneath the Pacific Ocean, and each one is twice the size of our moon. A much more recent study done in 2023 has revealed that the blobs, which were once thought to be anomalous, are actually actually the remnants of an ancient planet called Thea that violently collided with Earth billions of years ago, and this collision is believed to have been the same collision that created Earth's moon. Originally, it was believed that when Thea collided with the Earth, it simply bounced off, but the remains of Thea were never found in the asteroid belt or in meteorites. This study shows that Theo was actually absorbed into the young Earth and that the reason for these blobs being made up of unusual materials is that they actually belong to a separate ancient planet. And that is pretty cool. Next, let's talk about the dark biosphere, more commonly referred to as the deep biosphere, but for the sake of dramatics, of course, I just had to start with the dark biosphere. So this is a pretty fascinating aspect of our planet that most people don't really know much about, or think about even. When we think of life down below, it's usually underwater life that we're thinking about, but there's also this hidden world teeming with life 
deep below the ground, beyond the soil and the rocks that we see. There's a whole other ecosystem thriving in the darkness. It stretches deep into the Earth's crust, going down several kilometers. Now, how is it possible for life to exist so far underground, where it's dark and seemingly inhospitable? Well, like Jeff Goldblum says in Jurassic Park, life uh, finds a way. The deep biosphere is home to a variety of microorganisms that have adapted to survive in extreme conditions. These organisms don't rely on sunlight like plants do with photosynthesis. Instead, they get their energy from chemical reactions that occur in the rocks and the minerals underground. Some can even survive on nutrients produced by reactions between water and minerals deep within the Earth's crust. This has me also thinking about potential life in space as well, like rovers on Mars haven't really found a whole lot, but who knows what types of organisms could be living deep under the surface. Up next, we have the discovery of a massive mountain range inside of the Earth's mantle. The discovery was made using seismic waves to scan the inside of the planet, and what they found was shocking. Like an entire landscape inside of the Earth, shocking. In 2019, scientists found this entire interior mountain range with peaks even taller than Mount Everest. These peaks and subsequent valleys are formed by rising plumes of hot rock, and the discovery has shocked scientists, for lack of a better word. At one time, the interior of the Earth was thought to be fairly basic, made up of a crust, a silica-based mantle, and an outer and inner core. We know, though, that there's also an innermost core, and as technology advances, our understanding of the Earth's interior advances with it, and we realize that we really know nothing. But we're learning. Always learning. All right, now I mentioned that super deep borehole that the Soviets started drilling back in the 70s and how it taught us more about Earth's layers. But there's also an urban legend about something else they may have discovered while drilling, something much more disturbing. At one point, their drill broke through into a cavity. The scientists decided to lower sensory equipment down there to see what was up, including a microphone. Now, they recorded 17 seconds of audio, which went on to be dubbed as the sounds of hell. The audio they picked up was pretty harrowing. It sounded like a crowd of people screaming in agony, and it's all reverby. And the urban legend started getting traction in the West when the story reached the Christian based broadcast television network TBN, claiming that this story was proof of the literal existence of hell. Now, whether you believe these are genuine screams coming from the bowels of hell or not, it's still a pretty disturbing recording either way. Next up, remember how I was just saying that every time we think we know something, we all of a sudden realize that we don't, like me with math. Well, buckle up, because beyond leaking cores, extra cores, secret mountain ranges, and ancient planets, recently scientists have discovered a body of water deep beneath Earth's surface. A body of water with a volume three times that of all the world's oceans, 700 kilometers underground. Within the Earth's mantle, which is a layer of hot rock between Earth's surface and its core, there is another rock, a blue rock called ringwoodite. And inside of the ringwoodite is a water reservoir. And because of the sheer amount of water being stored inside of the Earth that was previously unknown, scientists have begun to reevaluate their understanding of the origin of Earth's water. While some scientists believe that Earth's water arrived in comets that struck the planet and created our oceans, this new discovery supports another belief, that oceans came as a result of water seeping out of the interior of Earth. Again, we really do know nothing Jon Snow. If you get that reference, very nice. All right, next on the list is the legendary kingdom of Agartha. Agartha is a legendary realm believed by some to exist deep beneath the Earth's surface. It's part of various myths and legends from different cultures, but according to these stories, Agartha is said to be a hidden kingdom inhabited by advanced civilizations, often depicted as highly spiritual or technologically advanced beings. Now, it's said that the Agarthans possess incredible wisdom and knowledge and beyond what we have here on the surface. The legend of Agartha is especially big in the occult conspiracy theories or alternative 
history. Some believe that Agartha can be reached through secret entrances like tunnels or caves. Other stories say that it can only be reached through spiritual or mystical means. Now, after World War I, German occultist groups like the Thule Society took a lot of interest in Agartha. Now, could there be a highly advanced civilization living deep beneath the Earth? Uh, probably, probably not. But one thing I know for sure is that they'd be pretty hot. And finally, we have the fact that the inner core of the Earth is growing lopsided, which may be affecting the strength of electromagnetic fields in certain areas of the globe. So, the Earth's inner core has actually always been growing. Each year, a full millimeter is added to its radius. And this happens when little iron bits of the liquid core solidify and crystallize, attaching themselves to the solid inner core. The crystallization process is also called freezing, which sounds weird considering the temperature of Earth's core, but it makes a bit more sense when you realize that the freezing point of iron is actually more than 1,000 degrees Celsius, 1,832 degrees Fahrenheit. Anyways, a study revealed that the eastern part of the core is getting about 60% more iron crystal growth than the other side, making it essentially lopsided. Eventually, the crystals do redistribute throughout the core, bringing back its spherical shape, but during the time in which it experiences a lopsidedness, it is possible that it affects the strength of the magnetic field in specific areas. The discovery has also raised a theory that the eastern mantle is slightly cooler than its western counterpart, which is why freezing takes place at a higher rate on the one side. And then of course there is the theory that Earth is just hollow, which James just mentioned. Um, so yeah, who knows? All right, I got a new Bigfoot video for you guys. This video was posted to TikTok by the Kentucky Bigfoot Research Organization with the description reading, alleged trail camera footage has emerged of what appears to be a giant black Bigfoot throwing trees and destroying a potential crime scene where it is said human remains were located. So this is a pretty clear video. The creature is obscured by trees, but we do get a nice long look at it. And just like the description says, whatever this thing is, it's picking up big logs and hurling them around like they're nothing. Take a look. Yeah, that ain't no bear. The way it like picks it up and just like slams it down like that. If I saw some hairy thing uh, slamming a log down in the middle of the woods, I would be booking it right out of there. There are a few things that make this video convincing. For one, the clear strength the thing seems to exhibit. One commenter wrote, I had a tree business before, so I know the weight of logs, and that would take extraordinary strength to do that. I also like that this footage was supposedly taken with a trail camera. If this had been taken by some hiker in the woods, I'd be wondering why they stuck around to film when it's pretty obvious you'd be running for your life. Anyway, what do you all think of this one? Hoax? Genuine? Let me know down in the comments. Next up, we have the shocking discovery of Cole Brings Plenty, an actor best known for his role on Into the Wild Frontier, as well as his work on 1923 and The Tall Tales of Jim Bridger. Plenty was last seen on March 30th of this year, driving his white Ford Explorer out of Lawrence, Kansas. He was reported missing the following day. After receiving a call about an empty vehicle matching the description of Plenty's, police canvassed the woods nearby where it had been left. And on April 5th of this year, 2024, Cole Brings Plenty was found dead. While the cause of death has yet to be shared with the public, police insist that they will continue to investigate the passing and provide more information as time goes on. Aliens in Brazil. So this is a bit of a weird story. Just back in January, hikers in Brazil captured some strange figures looming over them at the top of a hill. Figures who they believed to be of extraterrestrial origin. And I will say, whatever these things are, they don't look human. I mean, not quite. There's something just kind of off about them. The footage was captured on an island about 285 miles down the coast from Sao Paulo. In the video, we see a beautiful hillside, but perched on top are two tall humanoid figures silhouetted against the sky. And considering how far away they are, they look to be pretty tall. Uh, the people who posted the video said they were about 10 feet tall. Now on top of that, their bodies just look weird. They're very slender. And zooming in on one of these things here, yeah, just take a look at how long that arm is. I mean, sure, the image is blurry. Maybe it's just 
kind of uh, distorted or maybe, uh, you know, Slenderman was on vacation in Brazil. It does have a bit of a Slenderman kind of look to it. Now, if you're wondering, oh, maybe these were just like, uh, you know, scarecrow type things at the top of the hill, you do actually see them move a little bit in the footage and they don't move naturally either. I don't know, could totally be a hoax, could also be genuine. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Next up, we have another body found in the woods, this time just off of Richmond International Raceway, a car racing track located in Henrico County in the state of Virginia. Around 4 p.m. on April 25th, a man visiting the track went to use the washroom when he noticed a strong smell. When he followed it, he discovered the body of an unknown man or woman that, according to reports, was not skeletal but had likely been in the woods for an extended period of time before being discovered. Of course, seeing as this is incredibly recent, there is not much information on the case, other than it seems as though the body was left there intentionally. Police have yet to release the cause of death or any other identifying information on the deceased, probably because they don't know. They did state that they are sifting through missing persons reports in an effort to identify who the victim might be. Next up, we have a jogger who captured a pretty creepy image and didn't even know about it until later. A runner named Kay Borlees was on an endurance run with the Hawaiian Ultra Running Team. During a particularly harsh stretch of the loop, full of tree roots and water crossings, she ended up injuring her foot and had to pull out of the race. Her pacer, Cassie, had been capturing images the entire time though, so she had some photos to show her friends and family. As she scrolled through the images, Something caught her eye though, something that sent a shiver down her spine. It looked like a ghoulish figure had been peering out at her from the brush. Take a look. Kay posted her story along with the images to Reddit, and they were blowing up recently. And it makes sense, because that is a pretty creepy image. It looks like a, a zombie is walking through the woods there. Uh, both Cassie and Kay didn't remember seeing anyone else on that part of the trail, saying tourists weren't out that early. We didn't see anyone for hours while running together, so we were, and still are, positive there was no one there. Next up, we have yet another body discovered in the woods near Vietnam Veterans Memorial Bridge in Lewiston in Maine. On Friday afternoon, on the 3rd of May of this year, a body was found inside a tent in the wooded area beneath the bridge. Authorities were called and police arrived at the scene shortly after, around 4.30. Of course, as is with everything on the list, this is incredibly recent. I mean, you did click on a video about disturbing things found in 2024, just five months into 2024, so there's not much information. What has been released to the public though is that the body was removed from the area and brought to a medical examiner. The person's identity as well as the cause of death remains unknown. One of the creepiest things about the woods to me are all the noises. Through the dense vegetation and the sheer size of some forests, you never really know what could be lurking out there. So when you hear something like this, Yeah, it makes you pretty uneasy. That sounded like the werewolf howl from an American werewolf in London. If you've seen the movie, you know the one. Not what I want to hear while trekking alone through the forest. The video was taken in a forest somewhere in eastern Canada a few months back. Now, it being the Canadian wilderness, there are tons of things that could have made a sound like that. Doesn't make it sound any less frightening though. It could be a moose call. But have you ever seen a moose up close? They're gigantic. And there's also the possibility that it is a Sasquatch call. Can't write that off either. Next up, believe it or not, is not a dead body, just an incredibly creepy abandoned home filled with creepy and decrepit knickknacks. Earlier this year, two Canadian urban explorers stumbled upon an abandoned home while exploring in Ontario. As the explorers entered the home, they were greeted by a doll sitting on the staircase, and many other vintage dolls and toys were scattered around the house, some in okay condition for an abandoned house, that is, and some not really. Many stuffed animals had been ripped to shreds and strewn across the floor, making for a pretty eerie sight. As the explorers made their way through the home, they were greeted in each and every room by another pair of lifeless, unblinking doll eyes. One of the explorers even said that it was the strangest abandoned house they had ever seen, and that it was also super creepy. If you have a fear of dolls, I wouldn't suggest seeking this place out, because 
I don't know, you might pee your pants. This next story comes to us from Reddit. It was posted about six months back from a now deleted user. I hope they're okay. It goes as follows. Hey everyone, I need to get this off my chest. Something weird happened to me yesterday and I can't shake the feeling that I was being followed. So I decided to take a hike in the ravine near my house. It's usually pretty quiet, but yesterday things felt off right from the start. About halfway into my hike, I started hearing twigs snapping behind me. At first I thought it was just an animal, maybe a raccoon, but when I turned around, there was nothing there. I shrugged it off and kept walking, but I kind of felt like I was being watched. Then I started to hear footsteps. Not the rustling of leaves or the scurrying of small animals, but distinct footsteps like someone was walking right behind me. I stopped and I looked around, but again, nobody there. At this point, I started to feel really uneasy. I picked up my pace, hoping to shake off whatever was following me, but the footsteps kept getting closer. I could almost feel someone breathing down my neck. I broke into a sprint. I didn't stop until I burst out of the ravine and back onto the street. When I finally caught my breath, I glanced back at the trees, half expecting to see someone standing right there, but there was nothing. I don't know what to make of it. Maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, but I can't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone in there. And finally, we have the discovery of a 22 million year old forest located in the Panama Canal. And while this discovery is not spooky scary, like unknown beings and unsolved deaths, it's scary in the sense that it reminds us that we really know nothing about the planet that we live on. Earlier this year, scientists discovered a 22 million year old forest that had previously disappeared after a volcanic eruption. They discovered remnants of the forest on Barrow, Colorado Island after noticing fossilized trees on the island that they believe were likely all buried and fossilized by volcanic lava flow in the same massive event. The fossilized trees represent a species of mangrove previously unknown, and it is believed that they can grow to be upward of 131 feet tall, which is wild considering modern day mangroves generally grow to be only about 20 feet. And we're starting things off with the discovery of possibly the oldest art in the world. Now, the common belief is that Homo sapiens were the first human species to create art. But a finding in 2014 showed that that may not have been the case at all. Archaeologists may have found ancient art created by not our species, but by our distant ancestor, Homo erectus. Previously, we thought that the earliest evidence of sophisticated art dated back around 70 to 100,000 years ago, crafted by Homo sapiens. But in 2014, a shell engraved with geometric patterns was discovered in a riverbank in Indonesia. It was dated to be at least 430,000 years old and believed to have been made by Homo erectus. So Homo erectus was never thought to have been artistic in any way. Now, am I saying the art on this shell was like a breathtaking piece? No, I mean, it's zigzags etched into a shell, but it's pretty cool that this may have been created by an extinct species of human. This pushes back the timeline for complex cognitive abilities much further than we thought before, and it changes the idea that modern human behavior, in this case artistic expression and abstract thought, just suddenly came about in a burst of evolutionary innovation around 100 to 200,000 years ago. Instead, it looks like some of what we consider modern may have been around in our ancestors ancestors hundreds of thousands of years earlier. And speaking of extinct human species, there are also recent findings that point to Homo naledi possibly being more intelligent than we thought and doing stuff like burying their dead. Originally discovered in a South African cave system, these 300,000 year old hominins were thought to have had a mix of human and pre-human features, but not much else. But Recent evidence points to them having possibly been way more complex than we thought before. There's evidence that Homo naledi may have intentionally buried their dead. The idea has always been that only modern humans did that. Even more interesting are the engravings found on cave walls. Now, the age of the marks hasn't been determined to a T. If they were created by Homo naledi, it would mean they would have a level of artistic expression and brain power that, once again, we thought was unique to Homo sapiens. Now, to be fair, Homo naledi had uh, very small brains, so that's ju not just us being arrogant. It makes sense that we always thought they were just kind of dumb apes. Next up, we have new revelations about the hunting practices 
of foraging society. So here's what we've always been taught in school, right? The men in the ancient tribes would always be the ones out hunting while the women stayed home. And it turns out that may not be the case. Now, while it is true that men would have been hunting the majority of the time, there's recent evidence that points to women having hunted in about 80% of foraging societies around the world. And in a third of those societies, women were even taking down big game. So this particular finding started with a comprehensive review led by Carl Well Scheffler at the University of Washington, who delved deep into over 1,400 human societies societies worldwide, spanning over 150 years of studies. Now, as for why, we haven't really heard much about this before. It seems there's just been a bit of a bias. The idea that men are the hunters and women stick to gathering has been so ingrained in our minds that it's just always how evidence has been interpreted. But now with this wealth of data, it's becoming more clear that women have been active participants in the hunt all along. What's also really fascinating is how flexible women's hunting strategies were. They weren't confined to one tool or method. They were using bows and arrows, knives, nets, spears, and in some cases, they were even hunting with their young strapped to their backs. Next up, we have a discovery made in 2023 of a very old Viking burial, really changing our understanding of Scandinavian history. So this mound, known as Harlog Shagen, was believed to be a typical Viking Age burial site. But turns out there's more to it than that. Surveys of the mound uncovered large rivets, which confirmed that this was the site of a ship burial. Now, that's not surprising on its own. Cool, but not surprising. This is Scandinavia, after all. What is surprising, though, is the date. It was dated to around 700 AD, which predates the Viking Age by several decades. This makes Harlashagen the oldest known ship burial in Scandinavia, and it means that the tradition of burying people in large ships began much earlier than historians once thought. It also shows that the maritime skills and technology of the region were more advanced than we thought before as well, even before the Viking Age. Next on the list, we have the Diary of Merer. It used to be a pretty common belief that the Great Pyramids were built by slaves, being yelled at and whipped as they uncomfortably hauled massive mounds of limestone. But this version of events may not be accurate, and it all changed with the discovery of the Diary of Merer, an ancient papyrus with details about how the ancient Egyptians built these structures and the lives of the workers who built them. Merer was an official who oversaw a team responsible for transporting limestone blocks from quarries to the construction site of the Great Pyramid of Giza. His diary, dated to around 4,500 years ago, had all these meticulous details of the daily operations involved in this construction. What's surprising is that Mara's diary mentions the workers being well fed and cared for, contradicting that image we have of brutal slavery often thought to be the case. Instead of slaves, it looks like the builders were skilled laborers and may have actually been compensated for their work. So uh, there you go. Now you can rest easy at night knowing that one of the seven wonders of the world was built in an ethical way. Unless he was just lying in all those writings to make it all look better for like people discovering it in the future, you know? News of this next archeological breakthrough was just released in 2023. And for those of you not keeping track of time, that's last year. So human fossils were found in the Tam Pa Ling cave in Laos that may change researchers' understanding of human migration into Australia. These fossils were found buried deep in the cave's sediment layers, giving us very important evidence that links the journey of early humans from Africa through Southeast East Asia and eventually into Australia. The common belief has always been that human migration happened mostly through sea routes, but these human remains were found in a cave 186 miles inland in 2009, so that had scientists second guessing things. Using luminescence dating techniques, researchers were able to figure out a timeline, revealing the oldest fossils could have been between 68 and 86,000 years old, which pushes back the estimated arrival of humans in Southeast Asia by quite a bit. The findings could also mean that modern humans likely traveled through forested areas, possibly following river valleys on their journey from Africa 
to Asia, and eventually to Australia. Were all the high-ranking members of society in ancient Europe always men? History has always taught us that was the case, but it turns out that Bronze Age Spain may have had women in powerful positions. Back in 2021, a pretty cool discovery was made in Spain. The discovery was of a woman's remains, and it looked like she'd been a ruling elite. Located beneath a Bronze Age ruin and a site in Murcia, Spain, the woman had been buried along with valuable objects, like a rare silver crown. There were also the remains of a man buried along with her, and uh, he didn't have anything cool on him. He was just a bunch of bones. This ruin was also found to have possibly been the earliest palace discovered in Western Europe from the Bronze Age. The crown wasn't the only evidence that this woman had been in a position of power. It was also the location of her burial. She'd been beneath a room with a large building complex that looked to have been both residential and political. Basically, the place could have been a palace. Next on the list, we have the bronze statues. So in 2022, statues dating back 2300 years were discovered, and they were unlike anything seen before in Italy or even the Mediterranean. Led by archaeologist Jacob Taboli, the excavation team found 24 beautifully preserved bronze statues, including figures of gods like Hygieia and Apollo. They were also adorned with inscriptions honoring important Etruscan families. It looked as if the statues might have been submerged in the thermal waters as part of some religious ceremony, which helped keep them in such fantastic condition over the centuries that people of that time had been praying together and honoring their gods in these ancient baths. Now, what was fascinating about this discovery is that it looks like the Etruscans and Romans may have been closer than what we once thought. Next on the list, we have the possible discovery, heavy emphasis on possible, the possible discovery of Amelia Earhart's plane. So you probably heard about this in the news about a month back. People are pretty excited about this one, and if it does turn out that Amelia Earhart's plane has been found, this will put an end to a decades-old mystery. A man named Tony Romeo, the CEO of Deep Sea Vision, led a team to the Pacific Ocean, close to Howland Island, where they captured sonar images using an underwater drone. They scanned 5,200 square miles of the ocean floor, and they captured what looks to be an aircraft looking similar to Amelia Earhart's Lockheed 10E Electra. Now, some say the wings, or what look like wings in the sonar image, look different than Earhart's plane. They're kind of like backward. And sure, there's totally a chance this is a different aircraft, but the wings could have also been damaged, and that's why they look to be bent back like that. At this point, we really don't know, but there's going to be an expedition later this year to see if this really is her plane. So we just gotta hold out for a little while. Thank you.